every day is that he comes quickly, that his reward is with him, to give to every man according to his works. Amen? Amen? Hallelujah. The Bible is clear that every man that has the hope of seeing him does what? He purifies himself even as he is pure. Hallelujah. A soon coming king. He's coming to receive us unto himself that where he is there, we may be also. It's because he loves us so and wants us to be with him. Isn't that glorious? It's a little convicting. Uh, we know the perfection or we know of the perfection of the love of God. And I uh, have to consider that we sure don't love him like he loves us, do we? No. But he's a very merciful God, a loving heavenly father. And he is teaching us to love him with our all. Aren't you thankful for that? We've been on the subject now for several sessions of love, working out of 1 Corinthians 13. And I'd ask God to remember that God is love. And we look to the Lord God for understanding of what love is, what love is like how it should manifest in our lives as we would see it manifest in his dealings with us. Amen? God is love. Love, we, we definitely have to continue to work at an understanding to come to a biblical understanding of love because it is sentimentalized in our culture. It's emotion, it's, it's passion, it's lust. All kinds of things that are inconsistent with a biblical understanding or would only give a partial picture of a biblical understanding. We understand that we are commanded to love. Keep that in mind as we go through this study. You know, love is patient. You're commanded to be patient. Love is kind. We are commanded to be kind. Amen? Amen? And Jesus is plain, if you love me, you, you keep my commandments. He says in another place, keep my commandments and live. Amen. What if we don't? That should be obvious and clear to us how we should approach the subject. Amen? We're commanded by God to love. And, uh, of course, we will one day soon stand before God and give an account for how or the extent to which we have kept the commandments of God. So while we can sing songs of praise to God, such as we, we do on a morning like this, enjoying his presence, isn't that so gracious of our God to just give us an awareness of his nearness, that we might lift our voices and worship in spirit and in truth and, and communicate to him to the best of our ability, our love for him, our, our appreciation for all he is and has been to us and all that he's provided for us. How gracious he is, how good he is to let us know that he is present and receives our worship. It's a pleasing thing to him. We're pleasing to him. That's a blessing, isn't it? That's a God who loves us and cares for us. He wants us to know him more. He desires to reveal himself to us ever more fully. He is in the process of conforming us to the image of Jesus Christ. And in our love for the Lord and our devotion to the Lord, we come to him and, and seek that he would do his work to its fullest in our hearts. Amen? We understand that that is a process that <clears throat> involves God doing things that only God can do. And yet there is personal responsibility. We have to do things that God will not do. We have a will and God will not overpower our will. He teaches us that he's there, cares for us, loves us, is ready to help us to the, the fullest extent to do what he requires of us. But at some point out there, there's a boundary that God will not cross. He will not force us to obey him, will he? Yeah. Nope, he will not. He will not totally overpower our being and make us do what we ought to do. He'll show us. He'll, he'll guide us. 
He'll reveal, reveal to us plainly what we shouldn't be doing. Show us the excellencies of what we should be doing and who he is and what he is like. Who we are in him. But yes, there is a, there's a line that he does not cross in overpowering our will. We mention this because we're on the subject of love and we need to remember that these are commandments. These are requirements. We see that the scripture presents them both from the positive and from the negative perspective. There are things that we ought to do and there are things that we are commanded not to do. When we consider the things that we are not to do or things that should not be found in us because they are inconsistent with the nature of love, then we should soberly determine to give no place to them whatsoever. And when they're brought to our attention by the Holy Spirit, we turn from them, we repent, and we conduct ourselves by the grace of God as God would have us conduct ourselves. And we change the way we think. We change the way we act. That we might be God-honoring in every respect. Amen? Amen? So, from 1 Corinthians 13, we'll pick it up at verse 4. Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up. So we've made it through verse 4, haven't we? We've got a long way to go. <laughs> Verse 5 begins, Doth not behave itself unseemly. That's King James. Charity or love does not behave itself unseemly. Well, uh, it's helpful to me to consider other translations and some definitions. Unseemly. Frankly, that's not a word that it finds a common usage in our everyday communication. Unseemly. That sounds like King James, doesn't it? That sounds the way people talked a few hundred years ago. Unseemly. Love does not behave itself rudely. Okay. Okay, that's a little bit more 21st century, isn't it? Love does not behave itself rudely. Unbecoming. I'm going to give you a couple definitions and then to really uh, help make the point or get us an understanding of what's being uh, spoken of here. I brought along a few dozen synonyms. <laughs> <clears throat> Definition to, listen carefully now. So love does not behave itself unseemly. Unseemly to act in defiance of social and moral standards with resulting disgrace, embarrassment, and shame. To act in defiance of social and moral standards with resulting disgrace, embarrassment, and shame. When Christians act in an unchristlike manner, they ought to be ashamed. Anybody that acts in a manner inconsistent with what they know to be God's will for their lives ought to be ashamed. Is that not fair? If God has revealed himself to us how we ought to act, we know that with that revelation, any, any time God shows us what he expects of us, he also provides the grace, the help, the strength, the power of the Spirit to walk it on out. Now that may seem pretty difficult for us, especially the first time we're taking to run it, resisting sin and changing our ways, amending our, 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 our attitudes, our actions. But you've proven God, you've seen and known his grace is sufficient to resist the devil and see the devil do the fleeing to make no provision for the flesh, to yield your members as instruments unto righteousness and holiness? You've known the power and presence of God to change 
But it's a fight. It's a struggle at times, isn't it? But always when God makes clear his will, we know we've got the supply that we need to pull it off. And if we fail to do so, we ought to be ashamed of ourselves. Oh, let me insert a little comment with regard to giving no place to comment condemnation. That's not what we're talking about. But if I have not done what the Lord has taught me to do, then yeah, I've behaved myself in an unseemly manner, unbecomingly, rudely. Ready for a few synonyms? Literally. I typed it in synonyms for, for this word. And of course, you've got a few different uh, <clears throat> renderings. But they said that there were, they, they could come up with 377. <laughs> so few, just to um, get us on the right course. When we say love does not behave itself unseemly or uh, rudely, it's crass, vulgar, coarse, crude, common, gross, rough. There are some of these you see would not necessarily fit the context. Uncouth, clumsy, low, rugged, uncultured, unpolished, tasteless, uncultivated, unrefined, inconsiderate, ungentlemanly, uncivilized, thoughtless, insensitive, unmannerly, barbarous, barbaric, inelegant, provincial, unmannered, graceless, and then I, some of these, raffish. Never run into that word before. Ill-bred, insensible, illiberal, rough-hewn, boorish, loutish. Another one that would be new to my vocabulary. Low-bred, incult, roughneck, rustical, clownish, indelicate, unsophisticated, cloddish, uncivilized, oafish, lumpish, lubberly, tacky. <laughs> Catch my breath and we'll go on. <laughs> And literally, they had a lot more. I just brought a few of the best ones. <laughs> but the pictures that we should get, if it isn't clear, <clears throat> is that love doesn't behave itself that way. Love is not rude. It doesn't behave itself uh, unbecomingly, inappropriately, insensitively, uh, carelessly, in a crass, vulgar, rude manner. It doesn't do that, does it? And if we think that God's nature is love and we are partakers of his nature, we're his children, uh, then we can very readily make the connection that, uh, to give place to uh, insensitivity and unkindness and crassness and vulgarity and crudeness. <clears throat> it's inconsistent with who we are. And certainly inconsistent with the will of God for our lives. <clears throat> so what I'd like to do is, is uh, shift from synonyms <clears throat> and look at a few passages of scripture where people, uh, where the scripture shows us how not to conduct ourselves. Maybe some examples of people who acted in an unseemly manner. Good there? Just see from the scripture how, how these words, these, this truth could find application. So again, uh, <clears throat> just a few of them. Crass, vulgar, coarse, crude, common, gross, rough. Inconsiderate, ungentlemanly, uncivilized, thoughtless, insensitive, unmannerly. It doesn't sound much like the work of Christ in the life, does it? No, no. Go with me right over to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. And here we'll take a look at an example of disorderly. Disorderly. As we wade into things. Here, verse 6 of 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw from every brother who walks disorderly, and not according to the tradition which he received from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to follow us, 
for we were not disorderly among you. We didn't conduct ourselves in a disorderly manner, inappropriately, insensitively, inconsiderately. No. Nor did we eat any man's bread free of charge, but we worked with labor and toil night and day that it might not be a burden to any of you, not because we do not have authority, but to make ourselves an example of how you should follow us. For even when we were with you, we commanded you this, if anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. So, here Paul is bringing an instruction to the church at Thessalonica as to how they should conduct themselves, not in, an, in a, a rude or an inappropriate, insensitive, inconsiderate manner. Well, how, is, how would this, this disorderliness fit into that quarter, category well, or be, be classified that way? When a Christian knows how they should conduct themselves and they don't do it, that's unseemly, that's unbecoming. We name the name of Jesus Christ. We stand up and we say, I'm a Christian. Well, that becomes our testimony. But not just our words are our testimony. Our conduct is our testimony. And the way we live should line up with the way we speak. Our profession. Amen? If I say I'm a Christian, then very fairly anybody should be able to look at our lives and think, okay, that's what Christians are like. Because that's what Christ is like. We said, I think it was just that Sunday morning, we were talking about uh, some uh, Kiswahili word for bread, and we said that we would uh, try to figure out, you know, what that word means by, uh, by looking at examples and pointing to things and objects and things like that, right? Remember the little illustration we used? You stand up and say, I'm a Christian. How many people in this world know what a Christian looks like? Hmm? I was blessed there. <clears throat> Marianne was telling me a, a good testimony of, of one. <clears throat> they did shared it with her. They were at work the other day. And uh, <clears throat> our sisters uh, had good opportunity to share on the job and um, <clears throat> with other workers, but not with this one necessarily. This one came up just this past week and said, you got a minute? You're a Christian, aren't you? Yeah, I've, I've, I've heard you, you talk and I've, I've seen your life and I got some questions. I really think I need to know God better. I don't know him. Isn't that great? That's being salt and light, isn't it? Amen. Amen? Where people not only hear what we've got to say, but they see our lives. They see that we are indeed different. We've got a peace. We've got a confidence of who we are, where we're going in this world. We've got an assurance of our salvation. We've got a joy that doesn't fluctuate with the barometric pressure, or the, you know, the, the reports on the stock market or whatever it might be. Because it's a joy that comes from Jesus, who is unchangeable, a rock. And our, our life, when we stand up and say, I'm a Christian, yeah, everything about our conduct should be Christ-like in its character. So here, Paul just addresses the people that were behaving in, some, in a disorderly manner. Disorderly. Somebody saying, I'm a Christian, that doesn't look very Christ-like because Jesus teaches us otherwise. So fix it. Fix it. Pretty simple. Amen? Disorderly is out of the order of God. If it's not godly, if it's not God-like, consider it disorderly, unseemly, inappropriate. Go with me over to Philippians chapter 3. I brought along this one because remember that in our, our Bible dictionary definition of this word, <clears throat> uh, it said to act in defiance of social and moral standards with resulting disgrace, embarrassment, and shame. And here we, we talk a little bit about, about shame. 
to act in a manner inconsistent with God's will for our lives, we should be ashamed of ourselves. And it brings shame to us when we name the name of Jesus. Verse 17. Brethren, be followers together of me and mark them which walk so as ye have us for an ensample. For many walk, of whom I have told you often and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. Well, <clears throat> uh, again, looking to verse 19, <clears throat> Their end is destruction. God is their belly. Their glory is in their shame. That is, they glory in things that they ought to be ashamed of. And then what does the next phrase say? They mind earthly things. They mind earthly things. A Christian, yes, should be ashamed of minding earthly things. Ashamed of getting caught up with the affairs of this life, entangled with the affairs of this life. How often we speak of having to live here, but you do not have to be entangled. We're in it, but we are not of it. That's a battle. Keep it all in its proper place on a real consistent basis. But again, thankfully, God's grace is there for us. And if we're not walking in that, we ought to be ashamed of ourselves. We ought to be. If we are minding earthly things, if things of this world have their grip on our hearts, if they're constantly pulling us away in, in, in their distractions, we ought to be ashamed of that. Loving the world? The Bible is plain. If any man loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And then he goes on, he tells us, doesn't he? All that's in this world. All that's in this world, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. These are not of the Father, but of the world. And the world passes away in the lust thereof. Amen? That's plain from Scripture. And people that Christians should consider it a shameful thing to get caught up with the affairs of this life. But how many who name the name of Jesus... Uh, Bring God along is like a, an addendum. And some of them might, you know, might take offense at me characterizing it that way. But take a look at the fruit. Is God the centerpiece of their lives? I mean, they're, they're all in all. Their minds are set on the things that are above, not on things on this earth. They, like Paul, <clears throat> account the, the, the best that this world has to offer as but worthless. Is that the testimony? How many professing Christians? And you know, I know I use uh, uh, other people who might be anything but devout, and we'd question whether or not they uh, are, are Christians. We're concerned for whether or not they're genuinely born again because of their, of their condition. But we don't want to give any place to this into the smallest degree in our lives because we know that a little leaven can leaven the whole lump, can it? Our love for the Lord should be pure and untainted. Perfectly pure. Love does not behave itself unseemly. Uh, rudely. That's common or crass that we would consider valuing anything that this world has to offer as being of greater value than the love that the Lord has for us. That's common. That's vulgar, isn't it? We'll talk a little bit further about that in just a, just a moment along those lines. But he says here, their end is destruction, God is their belly, glory is in their shame. They mind earthly things. But for us, what? Our conversation is in heaven. That's our life, our lifestyle, not just the things we talk about. You know, we get together with our, our churchy friends and we talk churchy language a little bit. And get that out of the way and then go on to live in real life. Our life is in heaven. 
from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. Go with me over to Revelation chapter 3. If we were to take our definition to act in defiance of social and moral standards with resulting disgrace, embarrassment, and shame, okay, and we, we put a, a, a good, plain, clear, spiritual <clears throat> perspective to that, then if we are acting in defiance of social and moral standards that are established in the scripture, and those are the ones that count for us, Amen the social and moral standards that are revealed in the scripture. Moral standards. Social and moral standards that are established in the scriptures. We should not defy them. No, on the contrary, we should embrace those social and moral standards. Amen? Revelation chapter 3, we'll pick it up in verse 14, under the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write... These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Well, these people... <clears throat> are, uh, you definitely might uh, consider that they are tasteless, which is one of those synonyms. I'm sure you caught it. Graceless, common, vulgar, in that, I mean, how does Christian become lukewarm? How does, how does Christian become lukewarm? They start out that way? No. They allow the cares of the world and the, de the deceitfulness of riches and the lust of other things to enter in and choke out the life of the word of God. Don't they? Yep, yep they do. So now they're, they're, they're trying to live that, you know, a foot in the kingdom uh, of God and the foot in the world. Mm -hmm. Loving the world and trying to love God simultaneously. And God's not fooled. He says that's lukewarm. He'll spew us out. But the perspective, of course, verse 17, thou sayest, this is what they said of themselves, I am rich, increased with goods, and have need of nothing. Don't you run into people like that? You're, approach, you're going to approach them out of concern, concern for their spiritual well-being. And you're trying to be real charitable, but you look at them, and they look like, at best, they would be lukewarm. At best. And you approach them, and ask him, hey, just want to talk with you about, you know, your, your walk with the Lord. How are you doing your walk with the Lord? And what is so commonly the response? Oh, I'm doing just fine. Doing just fine. Yep. Doing okay. That's, you know, tantamount to saying, you know, I'm rich and increased of goods and have need of nothing. I'm doing just fine. Oh, yeah, do, do just great. And then you do a little poking and prodding, like the Holy Spirit does in this passage of Scripture. And, uh, and he turns up some things that they weren't aware of, they weren't thinking about. Maybe they did have things material. I mean, that's, that's not it. But just people, their, their perspective of doing good. Oh, yeah, I'm living a moral life. I'm living an upright life. And then God starts down with his assessment of their spiritual condition, doesn't he? And these are the things that we need to watch out for. Because sometimes we're all too quick to want to give ourselves a pat on the back, spiritually speaking, for the progress that we've made and the fruit that's being born. Praise God, maybe there is some fruit being born. But the Lord in his goodness is pointing out this and that and that and that. And you know it is not to condemn us. It's to purify us, to convict us, to bring us an ever to a, a place of greater and more fervent pursuit, a greater love for him. Greater, greater purity. 
And if we're thinking that, you know, oh yeah, I'm okay, I got, I got it together, I'm doing just great as a Christian. We ought to be ashamed of ourselves. Just fine. Just, just doing great. You know we are not talking about just walking around, uh, uh, oh, I'm just worthless, I'm no good, I'm a sorry excuse for a Christian. We're not talking about a feigned humility. Nope, just sobriety. Sobriety. Good sober assessment of our condition, our desperate need for the saving life of Jesus Christ, thankful for his mercy. Amen? Drawing on his grace day by day to make some progress in this, in this pilgrimage. See some victories in this fight. Because thou sayest I'm rich, increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. Anoint thy eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten, be zealous therefore, and repent. The shame of our nakedness. All things are naked and open before the eyes of him with whom we have to do. And we say, oh yeah, I'm doing, like God's right here. And I say, you know, how, how are things in your walk with the Lord? Well, you might tell a brother or sister, oh, oh doing just fine. <clears throat> what if the Lord asks you? Hey, how about our relationship? Why well, asking, Lord? <laughs> How about if Jesus asks you, what about your love for me? What about your, how's your love for me lately? If Jesus asks you, how is your love for me? And of course, you know, Jesus would also be asking, how is your love for your neighbor? Are you loving your neighbor with your all? Your husband, your wife, your children? your brothers and sisters in the Lord. You loving them with your all? Jesus is just making an inquiry. All things are naked and open before him already, aren't they? And we might think, well, yeah, I'm, and I'm, I'm doing pretty good. Is that the answer that we would give to the Lord? Lord, yeah, I'm, I'm loving them with my all. I'm fully committed to them. I don't love me, I love them. I love them more than me. I forgot about loving me. I just love them. You know, Lord. You know. But God, that we'd be able to answer that way, honestly. Amen? Go with me over to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. Love does not behave itself unseemly, rudely, in an unbecoming manner. Here, from a little different perspective, we read from verse 1, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. Well, that's it right there, isn't it? We're to walk in a manner consistent with God's call upon our lives, the work of his spirit giving us his nature. That's how we're to walk. Love doesn't behave itself in an uncomely, unseemly, rude manner. No. Love behaves in a manner consistent with the call of God upon our lives. Who have you been called to be? What have you been called to be? Do you recognize you're a child of God, a son of God, a daughter of the Almighty? Are you walking accordingly? That's a good walk, isn't it? That's an orderly walk. Walk worthy of the call of God upon your lives. I brought it along from the Amplified. I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, appeal to you and beg you to walk. Lead a life worthy of the divine calling to which you have been called with behavior that is a credit to the summons to God's service. Behavior that's a credit to the summon to God's service. 
You've been summoned to God's service as a child of God. Is that born in mind at all times through the course of each and every day? Before I am anything else, I'm a son of God. I'm a servant of the Most High. Why am I doing what I'm doing? Because that's my will, the will of my Father. That's my Father's will for my life. Amen? That's why I'm doing what I'm doing. That's walking worthy of the call of God upon our lives. That's comely. Amen? That's orderly. That's anything but rude or crass or vulgar. No, nope, that's, that's the way you are, you are called and made to walk. He goes on, and I read further from the NIV. Well, I'll read from verse 1 again from the NIV. As a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Would to God that we'd be able to hear God himself saying this to us and not just Paul doing some preaching. Can you hear God telling you to be completely humble and gentle? Completely humble and gentle. These words are inspired. Patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. Are we making every effort to build ever stronger bonds in Christian love with one another? That's the call. That's, the, that's what we have been called to. To edify the body of Christ. Making every effort. If God were to appear and have a conversation with you and say, listen, I am calling you, I am charging you with the responsibility to make every effort to build strong relationships with your brothers and sisters in the Lord. And I'll be back in 50 years to take account. How would we fare? How soberly would we take that commandment, that call, That's the way we've got to read these words. And don't give yourself 50 years. You're sure not guaranteed all of that. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. And this is, this is not just uh, make every effort to stay out of, uh, you know, to, to keep the, the relationships uh, free of hostility. No. Building bonds of love. Strengthening, edifying the body. Make every effort to do so. Look at me over to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. Let's look at this. Love does not behave itself unseemly or rudely or commonly or barbarically. From verse 13, the scripture reads, And make straight paths for your feet, that that which is lame... Be not turned out of the way, but rather be healed. So he's telling us here, we're jumping on in, but when he speaks of making straight paths for our feet, he is talking about the responsibility that we have to set a right course in a manner consistent with what the Bible has shown us. Make straight paths for your feet. If you know where you should be going, then set your face like a flint. Stay in the way. Don't be veering to the right, veering to the left, off on your own agenda from time to time and thinking that, okay, well, I'll get back to the will of God here shortly as soon as I finish my will. Make straight paths. 
and we talked about this years ago, it's, it's, it speaks of a rut. One of the renderings is a rut. For me, that was, that was helpful, because I remember, you know, just out in the woods sometimes, I didn't do a whole lot of, of uh, four-wheeling as a, uh, as, a, as a youngster, but we'd get out in the woods every once in a while, somebody have, you know, their, their, um, their truck or their Jeep, and you get in these roads, and they're deeply rutted. And some of you have been out in the woods like that, you know what I'm talking about. You can go down Route 3 sometimes and find deeply rutted. <laughs> Put up some of those intersections, man, and you know the tire tire lanes are deeply rutted. But out in the you know you go out in the woods four wheeling, and man, the ruts can be you know foot deep or more. And you get into one of those, if you're not bottoming out, uh, uh, it's hard to get out of them sometimes. The wheels the wheels are going in the rut, you're going there, but you know, try to get out of that thing. You have to climb up over the big hump in the middle or over the ledge on the side. In part, that's what this is speaking to, making straight paths for your feet. Getting a good path is hard to get out of. A good way that's hard to get out of. You know, in many respects, <clears throat> that is become an influence for you being here today. I'm, I'm, I'm saying you have established for yourself the good godly discipline of getting up on a Sunday morning, getting you and your family together, and getting out to the house of the Lord to worship God, be taught his word, fellowship with the saints. And that's a good godly habit to have well established in our lives. You don't get up on a Sunday morning, most of you don't get up on a Sunday morning anymore and just say, hmm, hmm, what am I going to do today? Uh, I mowed the grass yesterday, caught all the fish I wanted to catch. I've golfed till I'm, you know, done with golfing. Can't think of anything I'd better, better do. I just got, I guess I'll go to church. No. No, you've made straight paths for your feet. You've established priorities. That's not even a thought that enters your mind, am I going to church today? No, it's a part of your life. You're part of, a part of your practice. You've made straight paths for your feet. And for good reason. Because you know what's important in life. What's valuable and you don't allow the, yeah, the, the golf game or the grass or, well, the car needs to be fixed. Yeah, that may be true. But there are other hours in the day and in the week and in the life when all those other things might get some time and attention. But we're going to make sure that the priorities, the top things on the list, Get the consideration that they are due. You make straight paths for your feet. He goes on. He says, follow peace with all men and the sanctification without which no man shall see the Lord. Looking carefully, lest there be any man that falleth short of the grace of God. How do you fall short of the grace of God? Is that God's fault if you fall short of his grace? He goes on and he tells us how that happens. Lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, thereby many be defiled. Lest there be any fornication or profane person as Esau. It's Esau I want to talk a little bit about. Who for one mess of meat sold his own birthright. He's called a profane person, isn't he? Why? Because you went around cussing all the time? Uh, we, we think of profane and profanity. But that's not what's being said here, is it? No. He's called a profane person because he did just that. He sold for a piece of meat for a, a meal. He sold his birthright. Now, how many times we've used the, uh, the simple and obvious, well understood example. Uh, when you go to buy something at the store... Right? You take the coupons out of your pocket. You got your bends, right? And you're going to give them the money in exchange for the goods. Right? Because at that given time, you place what? Greater value on the goods than on the money. Right? I'd like to hang on to this 20, but I'd like the other... Uh, 
the, the, the Big Mac fries and the Coke for two. Better. Right? It, I know it's going to cost more than $20 to get a Big Mac fries and a Coke for two people. <laughs> but that's just the way, that's the way we, we, we understand, we grasp the concept of value. What value did Esau place on his birthright? Hmm? It wasn't worth a bowl of beans, was it? It was worth less than a bowl of beans. And he's, he's called a profane person, isn't he? A pro, profane person. He's walking common. Here he is, you know, it's, it's Abraham, Isaac, and... Uh, hold it now. Jacob wasn't the firstborn, was he? No. Why isn't it Abraham, Isaac, and Esau? Because Esau didn't place any value on it being Abraham, Isaac, and, and Esau, did he? No, that was just worthless to him, just common to him. I don't need dad. I don't need his birthright. I don't need grandpa. I don't need the promises they have from God about a promised land, a covenant, a Messiah. I don't need any of that stuff. I'm my own man. I'll make my own way. He was common. He was acting rudely, unbecomingly, coarsely. He didn't, he was a profane person. It wasn't valuable to him. So we, we got to ask ourselves, what value do we place on what God has promised us? What do we sell God out for? What do we sell God out for? You know, there are some preciously simple principles that are given to us in the Bible. You know, you sow to the spirit, you will of the spirit reap life everlasting. You sow to the flesh, you will of the flesh reap corruption, death, destruction, won't you? Real simple, real simple. So where do you sow in to? How are you spending your time? Where do values lie? He's a profane person for one mess of meat sold his own birthright. So now it isn't Abraham and Isaac and Esau. It's Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Yeah. We look at our lives. What kind of compromise do we give place to? What do we love about the, the world? What do we love about our own plans and purposes? I got my life to live. I know that where I want to go. I know, I know the things that I want to do. God's called you with a holy calling. He's called us to, to honor him with our lives. Place value on what he says is valuable. Amen? We all got the same number of hours in the day. What do we give ourselves to? Do we count the gift of God, the life of Jesus Christ? Hey, we're all going to soon stand before the Lord and give an account. And if we're smart, right now, we're taking a, we're taking a look. We're taking stock of, of our values. And the things that we give ourselves to, our time, our energies, our efforts, how we're spending our lives, do those decisions plainly reflect that we put surpassing value on Jesus, on knowing him more? Or do we love this world? Esau was a profane person who for one mess of meat sold his own birthright. Verse 17 says, you know that even when he afterward desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place for a chance, for a change of mind in his father. That's parenthetical there. Though he sought it diligently with tears. And you know that that is the way the, the verse is to be understood. It's not like God was unwilling to forgive him when he asked for forgiveness. No. He wanted to live life his way and also have the blessing, didn't he? And he asked Isaac, his father, for the number one blessing. And Isaac said, no. No. I've already given that away.
he was, he counted it common. Go with me. Uh, I was about to have you turn to a, No, that's probably a, a good place to finish it up. <clears throat> Love does not behave itself rudely, unseemly, in an unbecoming manner. Love doesn't act in defiance of social and moral standards with resulting disgrace, embarrassment, and shame. Esau is held by us in disgrace, isn't he? Yeah and shame. We look upon him and think how shameful of that man to count so common what should have been counted most precious. Well, the way we plainly show what is most precious to us is what we give our, our lives to. What we give our lives to. It might not be a bowl of lentils. It might be the television. Or it might be your job. Or it might be, you know, the travel. Or, or, you know, just uh, fixing up your home and having it nice and pretty the way you'd like. Or it might be clothes or uh, any number of different things. It might be romance novels. Who knows? What's important? What do we value? And we recognize that love doesn't behave itself in a rude unseemly or inappropriately. Good there? We are a people very mindful of the call of God upon our lives, the love that the Lord has for us, who we are in Jesus. And we behave ourselves in a manner consistent with that standard, a good biblical standard. Amen? Of, of, uh, <clears throat> of morality and social interaction. And we are very much a, a, a social being. We're members of his body. And we, act in, we are to conduct ourselves in love in a manner that would promote the well-being of those that are around us. I don't want, I cannot allow myself to be showing to my brothers and sisters <clears throat> that I value the things of this world above the things of the Lord. That they are in any way uh, competing or vying for, for, uh, for, for my attentions and affections and, and, and gaining an upper hand, a, a foothold in my life. Because I love my brothers and sisters, I am to conduct myself in an orderly manner. Plainly demonstrating that Jesus is, is the love of my life. And the love that I have for my brothers and sisters in the Lord is far greater than the love that I have for myself or the things of this world. That's the way we're to be living. We're committed to that in love, in the love of Jesus Christ. Amen? Let's bow our heads before the Lord. Heavenly Father, we do thank you and praise you. Bless your name, O Lord God. We're grateful for the work of your spirit in our hearts and lives, teaching us to love you with our all and to love our neighbor as ourselves. We see, O oh Lord, that a right understanding of these truths doesn't limit us to just thinking in terms of uh, discourteous or maybe a, a little sharpness in our word or selfishness in our attitude. We're to soberly consider your call upon our lives and walk worthy of that call. And we trust you for that grace, O oh Lord God. That in love, you would be ever to us as that pearl of great price. And that in that relationship that we have with you, where you are our all in all, we recognize that it positions us to be a good example to our brothers and sisters around us. That men would see the love that we have for you and want to emulate it. They'd be drawn to you. They'd be encouraged to follow that example. That we might be a blessing to our brothers and sisters. We choose to love you with our all.
And we don't make a distinction between, we don't make some big distinction between loving you and loving our neighbor as ourselves, Lord God. Grant us the grace, we ask, Father God. Thank you for it, Lord. Let's stand together and minister to the Lord in song. <clears throat> Hallelujah. 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 We give to you the praise and the glory that's due your name, Lord. We thank you for the work of your spirit in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We'll be sure and greet one another in the love of the Lord Jesus. God's grace and peace go with you all.